All right, and we're recording for our second Wednesday afternoon webinar workshop uh, talk for our week-long Nevada Week fish camp. Um, so we are back. Your cameras are off. Um, you're automatically muted, but please raise your hand if you want to ask a question. Thank you guys for coming back for the second round today. Um, we'll have the chat open and the Q&A tab too. Uh, the benefit of the Q&A tab instead of the chat is so your questions don't get lost. So especially if they're really good questions, um, you want to ask it so you don't forget about it, put it in the Q&A. We'll hold it over there. And then when we get ready to answer questions, we'll start asking them. Sometimes they can get lost in the chat, just a warning. Um, and also, if you miss some of it today, you will be able to see it later on on YouTube. Um, so this is also a family program. Um, no profanity or inappropriate behavior will be tolerated. And all questions in the chat box and Q&A should be on topic of fishing and biologists. Um, and so that we don't have to remove you, um, just follow these guidelines. All right. All right. So my name is Jeff Peterson. I'm a fisheries biologist of Elko. Um, I do some sport fish, native fish, amphibians, reservoir streams, kind of a little bit of everything. Uh, going over some fish habitat. I'm going to focus mostly on uh, streams and rivers, and we're going to talk a little bit about habitat, but we're going to focus more on work that we do to uh, restore habitat and make some improvements to habitat to increase for um, aquatic species or fish species. So uh, we'll see how this goes. Um, so when we talk about fish habitat, first thing we think of is is fish is obviously water, most important thing. So we're gonna be talking rivers, streams, lakes, um, springs, anything, I shouldn't say anything that has water because there are some other attributes that are pretty important. Um, as you can see on the, the pictures there, both of those have water, but probably gonna expect to see fish in one of those, right? Um, so we can look at salt water, fresh water. Obviously we're gonna be talking about fresh water um, and then suitable temperatures. So uh, the mud puddle, for example, uh, sun hits it, it's really shallow, it's getting hot, no good. And that goes kind of into the next, which is quantity and quality. Quantity is the amount. We got to make sure we have enough water. And then quality is um, attributes, make sure it's, it's good for the fish. So the right temperature, the right amount of oxygen, um, things along those lines. And then one step further, um, within those waters, we need actual real specific habitats that's going to let the fish um, grow, reproduce, feed, and then provide shelter. And, and that's the most important thing we need, it. Um, whether we're in a lake or a stream, is you need the habitat that's, that's going to provide this so the populations can thrive. If that habitat's not there, probably not going to see many or no fish at all. So as far as achieving habitat, there's, there's kind of two ways we can look at it. The first one on the, the left there is mother nature. Um, so if humans kind of step away and let the processes be, we'll get floods, wind storms, um, anything from you know, weather down to beaver. Um, beaver are a great tool. They provide a lot of benefits to the habitat. Um, so... <clears throat> Just letting mother nature do its thing, you're gonna see a lot of positives in a system. Uh, once it gets, sometimes gets beyond the ability for mother nature to, to make those corrections or to do it quickly, uh, humans, because we always think we know better, we're gonna step in and we can go anything from heavy equipment uh, to major overhauls down to what you see in the bottom is a uh, replicated beaver dam. And those are all steps to kind of move these systems uh, forward. So for a stream, here's a, a nice pretty picture, kind of explains the, the basic needs for a stream habitat. And some of the most important stuff starts on 
what you see is riparian habitat. That's the stuff on the banks. It's uh, brush, grass, trees, um, things like that. It holds the banks in place, uh, provides cover, uh, provides quite a bit. And then obviously, again, we need water, um, pretty important for fish, um, and then structure. And that structure is kind of what we relate to habitat. Uh, you can see some of the arrows are pointing to undercut banks woody debris structures uh, like rocks and then weeds and other types of vegetation. This is all the stuff that makes a complex stream habitat and provides fish everything they need. Like we mentioned, reproduction, cover, food. Uh, and to do that, all these things need to kind of be in place at some level. And uh, that's kind of what we're striving for. So a quick look at a good habitat, right? It's, it's, it's kind of what we envision. Cool, clean, clear water, no pollution, a um, little bit of cover. There's boulders, a little bit of everything in there. This is kind of what we strive for. Um, obviously, this is not going to happen everywhere. These are kind of high elevation streams, but uh, I think a lot of people, when they think this, this is kind of what they imagine of of good stream habitat. So on the opposite end of that, um, not good habitat. In the top right, you can see garbage, pollution. That's obviously a, a negative. Uh, the picture down below that is what we call an entrenched uh, stream. And you can see the bare dirt banks. Um, the stream is pretty straight down in the bottom. There's a lot of sediment. You're probably not going to find a lot of fish in this. Uh, I'm guessing more than likely, definitely not a lot of trout. So those are a couple options. And on the, the left side, we have, it's this, this picture is shows some overutilization of livestock. So we have the water's kind of brown. There's a lot of trampling on the shore and there's not a lot of vegetation. So again, you're not going to see a lot of, of fish in this because it's just not a healthy system. And this is when systems get in these positions, uh, that's when we like to get together from biologists to volunteers to interest groups and try to do some improvements uh, to move it the other way. And one of the ways we can do that is through mechanical uh, manipulation. And I've got a couple of just basic pictures here on the, on the left. There's obviously you can see a, uh, heavy equipment in the channel. They're just doing some minor manipulations, uh, gravel bars, changing uh, the bends, meanders, things like that. All the way up to the middle picture, they basically reconstructed an entire stream channel from pools, banks, everything like that. That was all done with heavy equipment. And that is, again, just to achieve or correct some of the errors that has occurred in these systems. And then maybe at a smaller scale on the right side, we have um, a group adding some substrate to the system. Um, sedimentation or dirt and silt in the system can cause problems with uh, more breeding portions, reproduction, and going in and doing these can uh, increase some of that substrate and make some improvement. So there's all kinds of level this is all really site specific, depending on what that stream looks like, what the problems are, and then how we can move forward to correct those. So we talked one about mechanical. Um, the other option is something that's a little bit more hands-on per se, and it involves kind of more natural uh, improvements. The one on the left here, we're looking at some boulders in the stream. This picture specifically is kind of creating some check dams, um, kind of slowing that water down where it's really straight. Um, but sometimes just putting out large boulders in the middle of a channel can increase habitat, uh, resting areas for those fish, feeding areas. Um, anybody familiar with the Truckee River? <clears throat> there was a multi-million dollar project to improve the habitat along there. It included some heavy equipment. They were rechannelizing, redoing banks. Then they, they did some boulder placements and it 
it just provides a complexity of the whole habitat that wasn't there before. And then the middle picture here, again, we're looking at that fake beaver dam, what they're called is a beaver dam analog. Um, it's a pretty big deal. It's pretty popular the last couple of years to go in and you can see the horizontal uh, posts that are in there. There's are pounded. Then you just get willows from the shoreline and kind of weave them in and you're, you're kind of creating a, a beaver dam. And one thing that can do is actually bring beavers in, which is, like I said earlier, pretty beneficial. Um, but it also can create a sediment trap. And once that water slows down, any silt and dirt is just going to settle out of the stream and, and help, again, do some improvements. So, um, and then on the right side, uh, just large woody debris. Sometimes it's just a matter of running with a chainsaw and tipping over some trees. Uh, sometimes you have to haul some um, lumber in. This picture, they're actually drilling and attaching some of those timbers together so they won't move. Um, but it's still kind of the, the same process. And, and all of these systems, whether it's mechanical or kind of this more hands-on, what we're trying to do is speed up the natural process and, and nature's process includes beavers and timber, um, wood. It's increasing the substrate with boulders and just creating this meandering complex habitat. And sometimes humans stepping in and kind of speeding up that process is the best thing we can do. We can go in and do all this fancy stuff with equipment, um, hand tools, boulders, it doesn't matter what it is. When it comes down to it, Mother Nature is still going to have its hand. Um, a flood could come through and completely change all the work you did. Uh, you could work hours and hours on a project, uh, two weeks of floodwaters, and Mother Nature is going to do what it can, but you're still progressing that system to a, to a healthier, uh, hopefully healthier system, and all that should increase uh, fish habitat from sport fish and some of these brown trout, rainbows, cutthroat, and then also your non-native fish, uh, shiners, dace. There's, there's a bunch of fish we can name off, especially if you move outside of the state, but a healthy stream is gonna provide for all the species uh, that are gonna benefit, whether we're catching them, just have the opportunity to look at them, whatever it is, uh, that's that's the best thing we can do. So as far as stream recovery, that's kind of all I got. There's there's not a lot to it. Uh, I don't know if you want to do questions now or wait until after Lisa does hers and, and do them then. We do have a couple questions for you. Okay. Um, one is, um, will beavers take up residence in beaver dam analogs? Uh, they absolutely can. Um, sometimes those analogs um, are built in proximity to beaver populations and those beavers will move and utilize those and then kind of build their own dams on the beaver dam analog and then establish. Um, sometimes if the habitat is healthy enough, you can put in a beaver, excuse me, beaver dam analog and then transplant beavers into that stream and then they will establish. So uh, they definitely can. Awesome, thank you. And thank you, Laura, for the question. And then from Claire, <clears throat> when you have multiple sites that are in need of restoration but limited funds or manpower, how do you choose which sites are restored? That's a great question. Right? <laughs> um, it is, and it's a tough one because there's there's so many answers. It's going to depend on maybe your species that are involved. If you have, um, say, a threatened species like the Lahontan cutthroat trout, then if that's the target you're going to work towards, you're probably going to focus on the areas where you can get the biggest bank for your buck. Um, as far as the best improvement to benefit the species with within your monetary limits or whatever's limiting you. If there's not necessarily a species specific, then you might have to look at um, 
So uh, again, just looking at some of the slides I threw out there, it's probably cheaper to, to cut some timbers and maybe some beaver dam analogs, move some boulders versus getting in a bunch of equipment. So it's going to depend on the size of the stream, the, the level of degradation, and then try to make plans that fit your budget, which is, it's a great question because in government and trying to do these, we're often limited with money and resources and trying to prioritize projects is a constant thing. We're always trying to get the biggest bang for our buck for sure. And then you didn't, um, we didn't get to hear exactly your region. So you're out of the Eastern region, right? Yes, out of Elko, the Eastern region. All right. So yeah, we'll go ahead and get into Lisa's presentation if you wanna share yours, Lisa. Um, okay, I wanna introduce myself again um, for anyone that was here from the um, biologist, ask a biologist, I was driving um, but I'm Lisa Osborne. I'm the Lake Mojave Fisheries Biologist out of the Las Vegas office for the southern region of Nevada Department of Wildlife. Um, I cover sport fish, habitat, and native fish in Lake Mojave, which is, again, goes from the Hoover Dam to Davis Dam. Um, Lake Mojave is really unique because it's, well, I'll go to the next slide here. So um, Lake Mojave is really unique because, well, and it really with any reservoir, you're going to have what's called tail water. So the tail water is going to be the water that is just below the dam um, at the upper end of your reservoir. So in the case of Lake Mojave, that would be Hoover Dam. So all of the water that comes out of Hoover Dam right below it, we call tail water. And that forms um, what would be at least like channel wise, what would be similar to just what the Colorado River was. And it does it, it still has a lot of current, the water is cold, and it's, it doesn't look like this big lake wide thing. And a lot of people sometimes here in Las Vegas will get, you know, I've, I've seen people on the fishing pages, and I don't comment, but I've seen people kind of argue and say, like Lake Mojave is, is not part of the Colorado River and, or the area by Willow Beach is not Lake Mojave. That's, that is the Colorado River. Well, Lake Mojave, same with Lake B, it's, it's technically, it's the whole portion between the two dams. That is Lake Mojave. Even though when you're down at Willow Beach, you don't feel like you're at a lake. Um, so the top of Lake Mojave is this riverine portion that is narrow and cold and it's all of the water coming right out of the dam. Then we get into lower parts of Lake Mojave and you have more what you would think about as a lake. Um, it's wider, the water is does not move as fast, there's not as much current obviously, and it is um, spreads into coves and then that's where that's where we place our artificial habitats. For our Lake Mojave Habitat Enhancement Program, the purpose of it, and I'm sure you, um, everyone on has read it, but it's to enhance angler success by providing areas of persistent underwater veg habitat that concentrate game fish um, in locations accessible to anglers. Uh, the locations that we, um, that we have these in, in Lake Mojave are eight different coves. Four of them are out of this Cottonwood Cove area. If you guys are familiar, it's Cottonwood Cove and Marina. Um, the four, three of them are immediately north of Cottonwood Cove. Um, you could, there's trails that you can walk over to each of these. These are Solicitor, Bass, and Box Cove. Actually, A is, well, A, B, and C. All three of them are immediately north of Cottonwood Cove. So not, we chose these so that they weren't just available only to um, boating anglers. We wanted coves to be, of course, available to shoreline anglers also. I mean, it is a little bit of a, a hike, but I mean, you're to this first cove here, Box Cove. Um, you could hike around that Cottonwood Cove point and be in that cove in 10 minutes. And people often do. And so then from shore, you would cast out there um, and they, they're in um, they're in about, well, 
we do um, several different types of habitats and I'll get into that. Um, out of, out of um, Catherine Landing further down at the southern part of Lake Mojave, they're in four coves um, above and below Catherine Landing as well. And the same idea, it's um, to be accessible not only to boat anglers, but um, shoreline anglers as well. And those are Princess Cove, Shoshone, Prospect, and Arrowhead. To date, we have placed more than 125 PVC structures, 201 assorted brush bundles, 112 pallet structures, and um, 24 poly shrubs, and 25 loads of Christmas trees. And that's about 625 Christmas trees. Um, and then I'll just get into a little bit about what each of these structures look like. These are some pallet structures and of course like you have a pallet we put some wood on it and you can really kind of build anything that the imagination can think of. Um, here's some largemouth bass. Uh, these are poly shrubs and um, this our habitat program we work with um, here's a guy from Arizona Game and Fish. I think both of these guys are from Arizona Game and Fish. Um, but we team up and work with Arizona Game and Fish. Um, the Park Service has come out and offered help a couple of times. Um, but this is, in Lake Mojave, this is a multi-agency effort. So um, these are poly shrubs. These, um, you know, the idea of these is to have a lot of surface area that macrophytes could establish on, and then hopefully you have a bottom-up effect where from there you have this macrophyte establishing established on all of this surface area and then you know smaller fish come that brings bigger fish to eat them um, these are brush bundles brush bundles we just gather on shore and we'll cut down a lot of times um, tamarisk or salt cedar right there on the shoreline and then we tie it up with um, you know heavy duty biodegradable rope and throw these brush bundles in. These things are in a little bit sh more shallow water. So um, they're usually only about five feet tall. So we'll put these in um, 10 to 15 feet of water. All of our habitats we have deep enough where um, they they won't be become a water hazard to, to boats. Um, and this is PVC structures are um, a big part of, of what we are currently doing. Um, so again, with PVCs in the corner, we can pretty much put in whatever our imaginations can come up with. And then we fill it with brush that's cut down right there on the shoreline. Um, it's invasive salt cedar. So we're getting rid of salt cedar while also providing um, brush that stays persistent. It's a hard enough wood it takes about five years before this brush um, degrades to the point of not being useful as habitat. And then we drop these in. Um, our, um, this habitat program is funded by our concert, habitat conservation fees. Um, we, we have several employees that go out at a time, but it is largely really pushed by volunteer groups, bass clubs, Eagle Scouts, um, Several Eagle Scouts have done their Eagle Scout projects on coordinating multi, multiple days of putting these habitats into Lake Mojave. Um, until about a year ago, we had a group of kids out of Bullhead City called Coyote Kids, and they would spend two weeks every summer. I don't, um, it was the worst time to be doing this in July in Bullhead City, but they spent two weeks in July in Bullhead City cutting down. Um, cutting down vegetation and building these PVC structures so that we could put them in the water. Um, I, wanted, I wanted to talk a little bit about how these volunteer days are led because they're, they're so strongly led by volunteers. If we didn't have volunteers to do these habitat projects, um, we don't have enough, enough personnel to be able to get the sheer numbers of habitats into the lake that would really make a difference. Um, but this, um, this is kind of like what our habitat days look like. Uh, we would go out on Friday with usually the kind of the leaders of the habitat, you know, the Eagle Scout and one or two of his closest helpers. 
um, and we would cut down vegetation, bring all the supplies out and stage everything. Then Saturday, everybody comes out, we build and launch the habitat. Um, and we do this in stations um, and you know, get all these in. There's usually tables of water and donuts for people. And then I have, hopefully this plays, um, I have a video put together by by Doug from our conservation aid. So we don't get the, is there sound to it? There is sound. Can you guys not hear it? I have it turned up as loud as I will go. With gloves, yes. <laughs> Show them what you got, Cole. Show them what you got. Come on, Mickey. Oh, yeah, this is it. You can come out because you have extra fingers. You got five, so. Oh, oh my God. God. We're well on So, we got zip ties. All right. Oh. I, Abby, I started to hear you. Did you, you, could you not hear any of that audio? We heard the water. Okay. Yeah. yeah I I mean, there was, there wasn't much to it. There wasn't, there wasn't any audio as far as anyone speaking or being interviewed. It was just, um, during several of the scenes, it was like chainsaws and water. So most of it, um, was just there on the screen typed up. Um, so we, over the years, kind of to complement the habitat program, we, you know, one of the questions is, how do we know that fish are using these things? How do we know that it is helping or doing anything? Um, so some of the things that we do, and you, like you said, you heard the water, we've gotten a lot of that video and underwater pictures by scuba diving and um, counting fish on the habitats. One of the other things that we do um, is track, well, attempt to track fish through um, through floy tags. And so I during the process of our surveys throughout the year, we put these little, um, what we call floy tags. They're like little plastic tags in the backs of small and large mouth bass. Um, this year, I don't know if my screen, we are putting blue tags in. Um, and I'll, I'll show a blue tag at the end of my um, presentation here, but, um, anyone out there hears of or sees a picture on any fishing page or gets a call, um, these, these are floy tags. They, they just, um, we, we have recorded where the fish was caught, how big it was when the tag went in. And so hope, you know, 
they're relatively cheap and easy to put in the fish. And so the idea is that, you know, if an angler catches one in a different location, we would get some movement information and growth information on how those fish are moving and possibly using habitats that have gone in. Um, this was a slide that was um, kind of left over from a previous presentation, but I think it's still useful to have in here. Um, creel surveys are, are something that right now you're not going to see. We don't have anyone out doing angler interviews, but um, creel surveys are a very important way that we determine kind of people's catch rates, angler use hours, and if anyone out there ever encounters someone doing an angler you survey no one is trying to seal anyone's fishing spot or hunting hole um please be nice um please answer the creel surveys um we won't share we don't we don't share fishing locations and as you can see with um with some of this the um location fished and I don't know how familiar with this area, these areas are huge sections of Lake Mojave and there's an equivalent survey on Lake Mead. This Willow Beach section is like 20 miles long. So we're not looking for like, hey, what tree do you fish in what cove? These are huge sections. Um, so we just kind of calculate, you know, someone fishing for largemouth bass is gonna go to chalk cliffs. So we kind of can quantify you know, what areas are getting a certain amount of use and maybe what areas are targeted for certain species. Uh, in addition, especially important right now because we don't have people out and conducting in-person creel interviews are these um, volunteer creel forms. And they are located on Lake Mojave at the fish cleaning stations at Willow Beach and at Cottonwood Cove. Um, soon they will also be at fish cleaning stations throughout Lake Mead as well. And so these are just little um, like half sheets of paper that just try to um, do the same sort of things that an in-person real estate survey would do. Um, is establish hours of angler use, um, angler harvest, and angler satisfaction. Um, that's, that's all. And I'm gonna stop sharing and I wanna show this little, this is our, our latest version of a um, Floyd tag that we're putting in. Uh, if anyone sees one, it would be great to hear about it. All right, so I'm gonna share the video from the Eastern region as well and their habitats are a little different these artificial fish habitats are made out of mostly PVC, weighted down with concrete, and placed at various locations of the reservoir for uh, fish to use, primarily largemouth bass and white crappie and catfish. Well, these are for different life stages uh, of that fish. Um, some of the more vertical ones are associated with predation and hunting and feeding. Uh, some of the smaller, more compact ones with lots of limbs are used for uh, escapement of young fish because uh, predaceous fish will be searching for food items throughout the course of the day and course of the year and young fish will come in here and be able to uh, escape predation. What they do is mimic uh, natural vegetation. If you look around we have a lot of willow associated with streams and rivers in Nevada but not so much in the flat uh, mud plain of the reservoir. So what we do is try to mimic it and it has a longer longevity than natural woody products say willow or uh, cottonwood trees. Once those trees are submerged, uh, they start to decompose. Anything organic will decompose over time. But as PVC, it should last 25 to 30 years, as long as it's not exposed to too much sunshine. So one thing I thought was cool from my experience um, before COVID actually, was I got to go out with the crews and um, this is also an electroshocking boat. So when um, the biologists go out and do their surveys to check on the fish, um, these actually come down and shock the water just lightly and uh, the fish um, wiggle up and it makes it easier to ch catch them and do a survey on them as well. Um, I'm sure, and it's different depending on who's doing it. Um, we were going after pike to 
check on them in Cummins Lake and see what we could find and try to pit tag some. It was definitely hard to tell at night the difference between those and the um, uh, some of the bass. Um, but it was really, really cool to get to see how this is all going in. This is all taped off so you don't get shocked. I just wanted to share that real quick. A little extra info for you guys, all our biology fans. Okay, um, we have a question for both of you guys. Do you go back down and replace or repair the PVC structures after the plants have decomposed? I guess that's to Lisa. That's, sorry, let me unmute. Um, so, and I was gonna say that that's part of what we, um, what we scuba dive down to do. We've sort of, this, project has been going on at some level with different types of structures. It used to be Christmas trees and then, you know, it was brush bundles and they did pallets for a long time. And now it's kind of moved into brush bundles and PVC. Um, and during two, I'm sorry, the person in this position two positions ago had been here for 20 plus years and that person worked with um, Arizona Game and Fish and they've been putting these habitats in since like the late 90s. And so this is for Lake Mojave, a long running thing. Um, and for the last, up until about three years ago, they, we had um, over a decade long of um, scuba diving where we would scuba dive on the habitats count the fish and during those scuba dives will take down things to do maintenance on the different habitats. So for PVC, um, the plastic is there. And so, you know, we'll pull up the sheeting, um, we'll, you know, we'll kind of like swim around and replace sticks and different submerged vegetation that like we previously, um, you know, put in the shallow water so that it'll get um, waterlogged and then we're able to take it down there and put it back in the structure. In the last three years, we've moved more to maintaining the structures that are in there and less just counting fish because we know that um, we know that the fish are attracted to these structures. And so now that it's like, you know, we're 15, 20 plus years into this program, there are definitely structures that need maintenance. And so that's that's kind of the bulk of what our current scuba diving efforts are is maintaining these things. Awesome. Thank you, Michelle, for the question. Um, so we have a couple, we have a few more. Um, one is for both of you guys. Another question, um, what determines if they, if you guys use artificial or natural materials for the structures and wood, like wood versus plastic for PVC? Go ahead, Lisa. Go um, for it. So, you know, it, it's hard. Um, one of the questions Abby and I thought was going to come up is that, you know, why can't we use Christmas trees? And because people want to help, they want to contribute, you know, well, I'm not using my Christmas tree anymore. I want to throw it in the lake. It'll be great habitat. Um, so we are not allowed to use Christmas trees in, um, as part of our Lake Mojave, Lake Mojave habitat enhancement anymore. Um, and that is specifically related to Lake Mojave and the fact that it is part of um, the national recreation area. And not only is, you know, there was some concern and this was a decision made prior to, to when I started, but there was some, there is concern that possible um, organisms on the tree or the tree itself being introduced into the lake. You know, these, these Christmas trees are not native to Southern Nevada. And so they're being cut down from like the Northwest, what's on them and we're just throwing it into the lake. But in addition to that is that used Christmas trees tend to have plastics and tinsel, like small microplastics on them. Um, you know, however, then our option is like, let's put PVC in, which is also plastic. Um, so we, we have to demonstrate that we aren't, to, to be able to have the permit to put these things in, we 
we maintain them. And if we had to, we could remove them. And that's really important because um, that plastic and that that's something that worries me is that, you know, what if um, what if this program kind of runs out of money? Who's what's going to happen to these things? They're PVC. Um, you know, I'm at one point we were um, we lost the permit to be able to put in pallets anymore because pallets for a while um, they were chemically treated. So we we weren't able to put in pallets that were chemically treated. Now there's new legislation. It's not even new. I don't think I think it's probably 10 years old, but um, pallets in the US are not chemically treated. Now they're heat treated. And so that's something I'm working on with the Park Service to try to get pallets back in our sort of toolkit. I don't know, it, to use pallets because um, like you pointed out, Michelle, is that pallets are gonna degrade better, but at the same time, that's a con, they degrade. And so then that structure is gone at some point. Um, so I mean, we just kind of choose as down here, we choose what's available and what we're allowed to use, but there is a balance. I mean, of course, like PVC lasts longer, but I mean, how how long do you want it to last? Um, and then there's there's definitely like an you know an ethical follow up that has to happen. We don't just leave these things in there and never go back to them. Um, so, so it's like you want them to last, but do you? So um, it's just a balance, I guess. I, I don't know if I have too much to add. That's that's pretty close, but it is a little bit different in the north. Um, the couple of reservoirs that we've dealt with are artificial habitats, a um, little bit smaller. There are some habitat, natural habitats already in there. So the ones that we've put in are, are we try to be pretty organized and uh, specific in where they're going and um, so that is limited with the artificials that we purchase, like the, the PVC that we put in. Um, that's done specifically through our agency. But we also get volunteer projects that, like Lisa said, people are happy to throw their Christmas trees in. But we try to, to regulate and organize that in a way that the trees are clean and then they're going somewhere that is going to be useful. So um, it's not just throwing your Christmas tree off your boat. It needs to be done in a way that has a purpose, organization, and some control over for sure. Well, good way to put it too, yeah. You can't just add it onto your boat. Um, another question, do you ever do large scale removals of problematic or introduced or invasive species, including carp? Yes, is the short answer. And the long answer would be there's a variety of species that we do not want. Um, in northern part of the state, we've dealt with northern pike in reservoirs we've tried to remove. Um, we do that chemically, uh, which we have a, it's called a piscicide, which is a, 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 it's targeted to just specifically kill fish. Um, and then in streams, we do the same thing for fish that compete with, say, Lahan cutthroat trout. We may be removing uh, brown trout, rainbow trout, brook trout. And again, that can be done chemically or uh, mechanically. And then I know down south, they have their own set of issues with all kinds of stuff, including aquarium species. So that's all yours, Lisa. Yeah, um, you know, it, invasive species are really interesting. I mean, there's, sorry, I meant to um, forward this link to my kids so they could watch. But, um, you know, it, a lot of that depends on location, you know, like, in one area, you can be have like an absolute like enemy of the enemy of the location and be removing like a smallmouth bass left and right because it's a threat to a native species in that area. But then, you know, down in another, you know, another part of the state, that is a sought after trophy 
fish that it's a game fish and it has important economic value. And that's a lot of what we see down here. I mean, you know, when we're talking about most of our, well, in the Colorado River, all of our sport fish, they are not native. And I'm just going to say it and I might get in trouble. They are invasive. We are not getting rid of them. Um, we am not saying we would want to, but a sport fish can still be an invasive species. And so a non, there, you know, and there's like, of course, like back and forth, depending on, you know, like, I'll just, you know, is, is a non-native fish always an invasive species? Just because you want it somewhere or you value it, it still is an invasive species. Um, and depending on the fish, I mean, some of them were not even introduced legally. They're just here now. And so, you know, we can, we can do things like smallmouth bass were not introduced purposely by the state, but they're here now. So, you know, let's make the best of it. It just so happens that Lake Mojave specifically has some really big smallmouth bass. Um, there's really great black bass fishing in Lake Mojave and in the Colorado River system. But I mean, the truth of it is, is that if we today decided we wanted to get rid of those fish for native fish restoration, we are not going to be able to do that because they are an invasive species. They're not going anywhere. Um, so, you know, in some, I mean, and I'm sure Jeff sees this and they see this all over the northern part of the state. In one stream, you can have different management goals that you're, ha you're removing like a brown trout or a rainbow trout or a brook trout. And then in another stream, another hopefully disconnected stream, you would manage, maybe you manage that stream for one of those fish. And so an invasive species, one place might not be considered the same in another. Um, so, for, I mean, I know again, like rambling long answer. Um, I do basically remove almost all carp caught in my nets. Um, and, you know, is that really doing anything to the carp population as a whole? Probably not, but um, we do it. Can it help if they were um, pregnant or yeah, if they, they were full of eggs yeah. too? Uh, they're full of eggs. I mean, carp, um, you know, they, they, it's a it's a huge part of the biomass in our reservoirs. Um, so. Um, so to go back a little bit, one of the questions is what part of the Christmas tree has the plastic that um, you were well, talking about? Yeah. So, and I, I've kind of thought like, gosh, you know, and the whole Christmas tree problem that, I mean, and I, I probably should, I, I know, I mean, I came from Arizona and Christmas trees were used in multiple small reservoirs there. It's not that Christmas trees at large are a problem. It's that that's the specific regulation that Lake Mead National Recreation Area has. They have, they have, um, they do not want Christmas trees in that water. And so it's not that Christmas trees are a problem like on the large or as a whole. Um, one of the reasons is, is like unknown microorganisms like bringing those in and introducing those. And, you know, I don't know what would still be on them after being cut down and sitting in someone's living room for a month. But, um, you know, and then a used Christmas tree, like maybe, you know, someone forgets a strand of lights and that's like a plastic string or like tinsel, like the plastic, you know, like strings, um, just stuff left on Christmas trees after they've been used and people are done with them after the holidays. Um, ornaments, I mean, so I don't really know. I mean, but I've personally used, and it sounds like they use Christmas trees in the northern part of our own state. So it's not necessarily an in-dow um, decision you know, Endow manages wildlife within Lake Mead National Recreation Area, but Lake Mead manages the land and um, kind of the decision making on 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 that. 
And yeah, sometimes they have the blocking the chemicals, but we always donate ours to the park <laughs> for now. Well, and you know, last year I in Boulder City, right down near on the way to the lake, there was a Christmas tree lot that like the day after Christmas, they just like threw, I mean, there had to be like a couple hundred Christmas trees that didn't sell. And I mean, those are not used. They're just in there in a pile. And I was just like, oh my gosh, like that would be, they're not used. And I've always kind of thought that I would really like to like maybe approach and do something with that where we could use, try to get back Christmas trees that aren't used. And maybe Jeff has more insight into um, research on this or what he's seen because it probably changes in like water temperature like a cold reservoir versus like a warm water area but um, you know I've kind of heard it's like a moot point anyway that really you only get like two years out of a Christmas tree um, as far as like being a good habitat like being good habitat because the needles sort of just fall off pretty quick and then so you know it's not really something that I've like pushed because you know, I've just been like, okay, well, it's not like that great of habitat anyway. Yeah, we have, we've seen this, we've seen the same thing in our waters and we've also, also read on it that they just don't persist very long. Yeah. Um, some wood species like a juniper are going to last a lot longer. So yeah, Christmas tree doesn't always, it's, it's not really a long term, but it does give people in the public an opportunity to feel like they're contributing sometimes. And and even that itself is a is a good opportunity. Um, Jeff, just to add on to that, do you think is there any part of the tree that could be? Sorry, I'll just read it so I don't butcher it. Is that still dangerous if you drop? I guess, yeah, is there anything that you can see that would be bad about dropping the Christmas tree in the water? So typically when we would do Christmas trees, um, there needs to be some kind of weight system associated with it. Um, when we've dropped them, it, like Lisa was saying, you got to drill holes, you got to run some kind of cable through that, some kind of anchor system. And from my understanding, that's probably going to be the worst opportunity for contamination, um, depending on where you're getting those, what they're made of, that kind of thing. Um, literally just throwing a Christmas tree in the lake. If it floats a little bit, it's going to just hit the shore when it's exposed to sunlight and weather, it's going to degrade even quicker. So of the tree specifically, there's typically not a major source of contamination or issue that I'm aware of. Um, there's always the opportunity, like Lisa mentioned, but, um, it's, it's probably but, the other portions. And, you know, the other thing is that specifically, I guess, for the park service is like, were those trees grown with pesticides? Um, you know, I don't know. And that's why, you know, the brush that we throw into Lake Mojave specifically in all of these things, the brush bundles and the pallets and the PVC, they are cut down, it's cut down on site. And it's not just Christmas trees. We wouldn't be able to bring in woody debris from outside the park at all. Um, so the debris and the vegetation that we're putting in our structures are there on site already. And so and that's kind of, at least in Lake Mojave, what we're restricted to. I just have one more question. Do either of you work with amphibians? Both of us, a little bit. Yes. <laughs> you can say that. Um, there's more amphibians in the state than most people understand um, or are aware of. So, um, yeah, uh, I do up north with predominantly the Columbia spotted frog, and then there's some other additional species of frogs and toads is all we got up here. Did you say you did too, Lisa? Um, I work with, um, you know, we have, um, in my area, we have relict leopard frog. It's an endangered, it's a listed endangered species. Um, and I don't, I'll just say that's handled more by our endemics biologist. 
and it it happens to exist in the upper parts of Lake Mojave in some of the hot spring canyon areas below Hoover Dam. Mm -hmm. And so my involvement is not, um, it's, it's primarily managed down here by, um, by, um, I'm sorry, brain fart, UNLV. Uh, oh, yeah. So um, there's a there's a professor who used to work for Park Service that um, has done relic leopard frog work for like 20 years, and he's helped reestablish and maintain some of the populations down here. And so he still leads that. In Dow's involvement, we um, of course we coordinate with them. Um, most of the populations are not in the Lake Mojave area, so I'm not involved with that a lot. Um, but when they do survey them, they collect egg masses so that they can raise, um, raise those frogs and then um, reestablish other populations and supplement existing populations. Um, and my involvement, honestly, I drive them up the canyon so that they can access the site. And so I go, but I, I don't lead those surveys the same way I lead sport fish and native fish surveys within Lake Mojave. I just get to kind of like go to these cool places. Um, so I don't, I don't even have to do the reports for them. So that's like, I'm like literally not that involved. So if I'm not doing a report on it, then I'm not very involved. Okay. So. Good. Well, we went over an hour. Very exciting. <laughs> My you guys are awesome. Thank you all. Thank you guys for hosting. And thank you for our participants and the awesome questions tonight. Our next one, our next presentation is at seven o'clock, all about trout tips and tricks. Um, it'll be hosted by the Western Region biologist, angler educator, and one of their um, awesome guides from the area. And then we'll have one more afternoon tomorrow. Um, I'm actually forgetting what we're doing tomorrow now. It's been nonstop. So same time, 3 and 4.30 again tomorrow, and then we're off for the weekend. <laughs>